Hey, Father. Oh, I'm doing well. How are you? What story are we doing? Amazing. Okay, great. Call back later. <gasps> Welcome to another episode of Bible Stories with me, Brianda. Brianda. And today we are diving into a brand new book, the book of Ruth. Ah! Okay. And today we've got my girl Clara. Hey. In a different position. I'm upgrading. <laughs> I know you've upgraded. You've been promoted. I've been Clarita. promoted. Exactly. <laughs> yes. She's behind the desk. You guys. I let's be let's be patient today. You know, this is her first <laughs> podcast that she's engineering and I have very high hopes. I've been requesting this for weeks. You don't know this, but I I feel like this is going to be a learning experience for everyone, but I just have very high hopes for you. Thank you. What what's like what are your thoughts? How does it feel like to be behind the desk? Hit I'm excited. I'm really excited. I love it. Yeah. I just of course hope not to screw up, but You're not going to screw up. I'm excited. No, I'm super pumped. I already like you guys. She has been on her P's and Q's, like setting everything up. Y'all, when I'm with Weezy, Weezy's so damn busy. She's like, bitch, just put the phone here. I'm fucking moving <laughs> furniture around. You know what I mean? Like, which we love Weezy here. Shout out to Weezy. She'll be back on another week. I don't know. She's in LA doing major Hollywood things. <laughs> but um, I, I know that having you here already, the way you were like switching the lights and you're super attentive and it makes me really excited. I'm trying. I was, we also have Eden in the, in the studio. Eden, I mean, you may not be able to hear him say hi. Um, I was saying before, like coming here to record episodes is like so exciting. It, I, I don't know if it, it, the last time I felt this excited about anything, I do was like in high school, like before shows, before like performances. And I mean, you guys, I've been trying to act for like 10 years, except I've been doing more like trying than actually acting. So like for the first time I get to do something on a routine basis, I, I can feel myself becoming more comfortable and like sitting into it. It just feels good to do something that you love. Mm. Oh, mm -hmm. fun. it feels like the pieces are coming together. You know what I'm saying? And, you're killing it. I love it. You guys, but I, having someone be so eager and excited to also learn that there's nothing better than working around that. That's true. That synergy, that's, that's like, that's a team. Like, oh, I have, oh, someone here cares in just as much or more. Okay. Oh, that makes me want to then be better and do more and do better and come more prepared. And like, y'all, like podcasting is a whole new mode. I have a question actually. And, oh man, Eden, I wish you could, I wish there was a mic for you. Uh, can, can, well, I, can, can you sit on my lap? <laughs> um, do you think that, or maybe you can like pop in on this mic real quick. Do you think that podcasting is going to continue being this like force for much longer. Cause I have, oh, I, yeah. I have thoughts. Yeah. Uh, and Oh God, you have you on the camera too. Yeah. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. Hey, Eden. Um, yeah, undoubtedly. As long as like minorities do it, it's cool as fuck. You think the minorities, we just got here. We're going to show everybody how fucking dope That's podcasting can be. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. See. Okay. Well, everyone say hello and bye to Eden. Um, okay. I have thoughts and I don't want to bore anyone because there's, if there's one thing I hate about podcasters is when podcasters talk about podcasting or whatever. It's like, no one else cares. Just do the show <laughs> and that much I'll give them, but this is the, I'll, I'll keep it brief for whatever reason. I've seen the podcasting industry make so many shifts and much like any other industry, any other medium, anytime you start to see big money funneling in, that's when shit be, uh, uh, starts to monopolize and you already see it now, Spotify acquiring so many different companies. It is just starting, but is it also just ending? Shows are just getting million dollar deals. I guess you're right, I know. Why ending? Why is it ending? Let me tell you why. I, I think that podcasting as we once knew it is ending. Like just audio? Just audio is, I think that is also ending. Now it's going to be a, you're going to need the YouTube, the TikTok, the whatever. Oh, you're going to need enough. everything. It's I, transitioning I, maybe. 
no? I feel yeah. like it's transitioning more to like um, a show more than just like a podcast where it's just audio. Just gonna say that though. And when oh. you guys, you guys, the, the second this much money is involved, you know that things are shifting, but that's what I'm saying makes me a little bit uneasy. I'm like, oh, the reason why we like podcasting so much is because you get you got to do and say whatever the hell you wanted, and like oh, it was okay. different. Now it's like not the same a little bit. That's why mm. I'm like, is it ending? And people like me, people who are like, like for example, actors, and yes, and, and like people trying to get into the creative mm -hmm. industry or whatever. Like it's very accessible, but also for artists who struggled in their own fields in the industry. Like, dude, we just got out of a pandemic. Actors had to now. We went from auditioning in the rooms with these network offices, like to now self taping every single tape. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So that literally, the entertainment industry hit a very. Um, big shift in the way we went about things and what's podcasting, but like storytelling and like talking and it, it gave you a platform. So in that sense, I also think that it's expanding. I don't know. I was just curious at cause you, you know, you engineer like with the brilliant idiots, you engineer horrible decisions. You're and uh, hear me out with Wayno. Like you do so many shows and I was just curious to hear your thoughts on podcasting. All right guys, sorry to bore you. Um, so today Clara, mm -hmm. on your first day, we're going to go back to doing some listener questions okay. just because this week, the book of Ruth is super short and I, we can fluff it up with some mm -hmm. listener questions. And I have a question this, for you also. So I'll just let you do the um, you, You're saying that you have a question? First. Yeah. I'll let you do yours first and then I'll drop it. Okay. We'll just do like a couple. Um, and I'm also curious. She did not brief me on the question. Mm -hmm. So in my head, I'm like, <laughs> crap, is she going to, is she going to uh, stunt me? Oh, well, just kidding. The Holy Spirit is over here <laughs> and he cannot be uh, stunted. All right. Let's see. And also just make sure you can't see my nipple paces. For those of you guys that aren't watching the YouTube channel, I look like a psychedelic Pepto-Bismol. I got <laughs> dangling star earrings and no bra. <laughs> Think about right now. Um, mazel. Okay, wait, let's get some questions. Um, da -da -da -da. Do you have close friends who are strong Christians? I do. I have uh, a lot of close, strong Christian friends that I've met through my like Bible study group and like through my mom, I've met a lot. My cousin Alana is really, uh, I wish we spoke more, but she's, she's been in this for a minute. I remember being like 12 years old, being in DR with her and like her knowing the Bible front to back. And I would ask her like, Oh my God. And then what happens? And then whatever. So the, if anything, Alana, if you're watching this, like she was the person who like taught me most about That's the Bible cool. first as an atheist. Like I was like an atheistic little demon child. Mm -hmm. Anywho. Um, so I do, I do have a lot of close Christian friends. Thank you for uh, asking that. I, uh, I have another question that I wanted to, Oh, uh, okay. Hey Brie, love what you do. Uh, any scripture for anxiety, babe? I got you covered. Um, so when I saw that question, I was like, girl, I done had a panic attack last weekend, okay? And the first thing I do is like, I pray. Like, <laughs> what is this? This is not of God. Like, I'm, I, the, anyone who's ever experienced a proper panic attack knows that that is debilitating. It, it's like borderline paralyzing, you know? And the first thing I do, I love the book of Hebrews and to answer your question, I, I brought up a couple so I wouldn't forget, but more specifically, Hebrews 13 verse six is one of my favorite ones. It's the one that got me out of last weekend's uh, panic attack. Hebrews 13, six. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Every time I read that, I'm like, <sighs> What could that bitch do to me? <laughs> I'm protected, okay? Um, but other uh, scriptures that help in times of, uh, you know, anxiety, grief, any adversarial feelings that you may be feeling, like the book of Psalms it was one of the first books I started reading, period, of the Bible. And it also is just so helpful and soothing and comforting. So just like feather through Psalms, but more specifically, uh, uh, chapter 15, verse 22, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will, he will never let the righteous be shaken. Another one from Psalms that I absolutely 
love is Psalm 37, verse seven, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Don't worry about other people, focus on me. Just like what Jesus told uh, Peter at the Sea of Galilee in um, the book of John. Another Psalm one, the last one from Psalm that I'll, that I'll say, and it's probably one of the most famous ones for, you know, anxious, anxious, uh, feelings, uh, anxiety, um, uh, chapter 121 verses one to two. I lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Like, oh, my Christian brothers and sisters, like y'all know, please like leave YouTube comments. Let us know. Like y'all know what I'm talking about. The book of Psalms is so comforting. So that's what I would do um, for anxiety. What do you do when you're anxious? You ain't got God. I mean, mm. no, God got you though. But um, you yeah. say so. <laughs> Stop it. He does. Um, uh, for those um, of you guys who are just listening, uh, she is not a Christian. She's a non-believer. Is mm -hmm. what we call him. I pray for her. It's okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. What do you do when you're anxious? Um, I self-reflect a lot. Like I, I, I don't know how. You what say does self-reflect look like? Like um, I, I tend to like auto analyze me a lot. So I try to um, find what is causing me this anxiety and how I can solve it. Like, and if it depends on me, I'll figure out a way of like getting, you know, a solution. If it doesn't, what's the point of getting anxious about it? If but I do, can. but you, f you just rely on your own devices. What do you mean? It's just you, you just rely on yourself. You're self-reliant. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah, a lot that of faith and in I'll yourself. Like, obviously, do something that feels good for me, something that I like, and like I don't know, just treat myself with. My favorite thing to do is a bubble bath. Bubble bath. I, I love, love a good bubble, bubble bath. bath. Yeah. Okay. Self reflect mostly. I like that. Oh, there's so many questions here that I. You guys had. You guys did very well. Anytime I post on Instagram, like. Uh, ask me questions. They get better and better every week. Uh, please keep doing that, guys. Uh, and if I don't answer your question this week, keep asking the same ones. Like I'll remember to go to them eventually. You know, we just have we only have so much time. Mm -hmm. um, and there and there's some here that I don't feel qualified to answer. You know, um, like what do you mean? There's just some. There there's just some. You know, with Christian influencers or Christian. But um, Eden asked me earlier, like, what happened to TikTok? Are you not doing the personal TikToks anymore? And I just noticed a tree on all these Christian TikToks that was so, um, like, unattractive to me. And if anyone knows me, I've said this before, like, I won't do anything that's not fun for me. And if mm -hmm. I notice any kind of, like, I don't want to be looped in with it. I'm like, you know, what? not all of them. There are many Christian influencers that I really love, like at Jelani Baina on TikTok, my girl Shay Love on TikTok. There are some Christian TikTokers that I love. So that I'm not speaking for everyone. You know which one I really like that you used to do? The one that um, would do the whole trajectory for you getting ready, coming to the studio. Oh, oh okay. Really those are like, cool. Yeah. I can bring those back like for the behind sure. the scenes kind of. Behind the scenes for the pod, I can do, yeah. but it was, it's more like, like really popping on TikTok, which is like my main focus. If anyone mm -hmm. hasn't noticed, I'm like hardly on Instagram, but like it, 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 you need to show more of yourself. That's what really sells on TikTok. And unfortunately, like I've seen so many Christian influencers on TikTok let me down. Mm. Like within the last couple months, I stopped following like 25 different Christian influencers because of some dumbass ish that they said like damaging th like this is the reason why what i do is met with so much strife and so much resistance you're making it harder what kind of discipleship is that mm -hmm. the other day i saw this girl on tiktok who went mega viral because people you know on tiktok you can stitch things you'll stitch the beginning of a tiktok and then continue on with whatever you're doing People don't realize that if you let the stitch continue, you see the original TikTok. This girl, the first stitch was, what's something that you think that would give you, that would make people hate you or whatever, something like that. Mm. And she said, I think mental illness <gasps> is just demonic. What? I think that's the D I think that's the devil or something like whatever. Like, oh. and by the way, I followed this girl for months and there was, yeah, there was some dumb stuff that she was saying. I wouldn't care, but 
she started saying that like depression and anxiety was Satan and that people use that. It's just the most dangerous stuff. There are young people on TikTok. You are dissuading so many people from Christianity. Mm. How foolish, how foolish. And, and then wait, the comments. Oh, and this oh, is you why can I, only imagine. And this is yeah. why I stopped following mad people. Mm. Cause then there were some of my favorites on there being like, amen. Awesome. And I know what they're trying to do. Like, I know what she's trying to say. You know, I, I, I know that because I know the word. I've been studying long enough to understand what she was, what angle she was going mm. for. She missed the mark. And, and that's why I stopped doing TikToks because I almost don't even want to be affiliated with that. It's so corny and so disappointing. So um, also, I don't even know where I was going with that. That was a high tangy. What? Also, one thing though, her approach, I think that like as believers, you're supposed to like help other people out, right? And I don't know, like spread the word and make everyone feel comfortable with religion or whatever. That's a very negative speech to have towards someone that's suffering from mental breakdowns or whatever. Like if anything, if you would want people to like get closer to your religion or your belief, you should just be welcoming and like offer a solution to whatever, like not attack them like and that. And this is the problem. You want to know something? I went on a rant on the Lil Nas X thing months ago that everyone keeps bringing up or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I was actually a fan of Lil Nas X. I, in a sense, I still kind of am, to be honest with you. I think artistically, like I think his team does really well with his image and stuff. Like, but you want to know what's so funny is I just hate people who do shocking things for clicks or whatever. Like, you know what I mean? And you want to know what's funny about this girl is that I feel like she was just trying to go viral. Well, she did. It ended up getting like a million some odd things. She ended up deleting the, the video actually. But in my head, I'm like, that's the flip side. Christians can do it too. Christian influencers can also do the same thing that mm. I find annoying. Because that's what it works at the end of the day, no? In this industry, just like killing it. Yeah, but it at the with expense of what? It's just at the expense of what, what if someone was just, pay, what if so, I get so many DMs with people being like, I just started reading because of Bible stories. I just started reading the text. That's you so have cool. no idea how like, that makes me like emotional. Like even thinking about, that's what I, that's like, who could you want more, more could you want? You know, that's so, that's, that's the Holy, that's what I, well, that's, there's nothing more important to me than someone picking up the text. What if someone from Bible stories was picking up the text week one she saw your freaking stupid ass clip and put the book down. Like, Sorry, it's just so annoying. No, but if anything, she, I don't know. Like to me, if that's demonic or whatever she called it, and you're just starting to read, isn't God or reading or the Bible the salvation? So if anything, it would just make them want to read It's even more than more. just reading the Bible. That's for sure. Oh. It's more than just reading the Bible. Developing faith that's something that if you're in your infancy and something impedes on your growth, that's it. You've mm. just delayed their trajectory. Why would you do that? That's the problem with some of these churches. Mm. You know what I mean? And here's the thing. You heard me just say, bitch. You heard me say all these things that a lot of Christians are turned off by. These are curse words. And I understand that. As I've said before, I want to stop swearing. Pray for me, brothers and sisters. Like, And I mean that. I'm not just saying that. But like... What are we doing here? What are we doing here? Anywho, guys, that's that's that question. Um, I got another question that I do want to answer. Uh, what's your approach to studying the Bible? I read three to four chapters a day, and then I supplement that with Bible study every Thursday and Tuesday. Uh, and Monday sometimes. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in the Word quite often in the throughout the week. Um, let's see. There's something that I don't feel uh, comfortable, like how can I surrender myself to God? Those are questions that I don't think I have. Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm a babe in the faith. So I don't know if I, I have the right response. The only thing I can say is prayer and reading the text, allowing God to speak to you through these stories. My biggest hang up when I was an, an atheist reading the text was I would read these as stories, like in just stories, like literature. When you're ingesting the Bible and I say ingesting, cause it's 
nutritious. It's food for your, for something that's not your stomach. It's like your spiritual stomach. Like allow yourself to be changed. Pray, praying before reading. And I, no, I'm not answering this question. I'm just trying to scrape the surface, you know, like how do you surrender God? Like allowing him to speak to you through the text, developing an appetite for theological curiosity, things like that. Don't you go to study the Bible too? Don't you go like, of study? course. So maybe I, that's another, uh, another, Hey man, but here's the thing. I think that that question is so much deeper. How can I surrender? Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Like, just like doing the study with someone that is more, Experience more, yeah, absolutely. Be well, first of all, being around people of faith as well helps. It mm -hmm. just is what it is. It's true. You always hear people, and I've lost a lot of friends. I've lost a lot of friends that knew me before and know me now and saw some changes, right? Not many. I, I can say that I, not many, but there are some that view you now and they see like fraudulence when it's like the opposite. They weren't real friends then. Absolutely. You're right, they weren't real friends. Mm -hmm. um, and then someone asked me like, what's the worst book to read in the Bible? Nothing's the worst, but there are ones that I like, oh, I'm like, oh God. And y'all, we just passed them. The book of numbers is the... <laughs> that was my first episode. And was, I actually found it exciting. So you did a good Girl, job. you and you only, because numbers, like the census, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, those books are tough to read. If you're really reading the Bible, which I have been in, which is why I always say this podcast is like saving my life because it's making, I have to be on top of my studies for the show, for the sanctity of the show, for the, you know, the authenticity of the show. Listen, those, anytime I got to read Leviticus, Deuteronomy and Numbers, I'm like, Lord, please, ayúdame. So now, instead of reading it, you can just tune in, watch your episode. Yes, yes. please do. <laughs> um, okay, give me your question. Hit me with your question. Clara has a question for I the pulpit. I have a question for you. Yes. No. Are you big on, on the church or just like the Bible? Like, I know you go to church, but are you like big, big on church or just like it's a... Bye, honey. Everyone say bye to Eden. Bye, bye Eden. I know. <laughs> are um, you big on it? Like, I know you go to church and that you study the Bible in church, but are you like, is it like a main part of your? My church experience is solely to hear the gospel from like people that I know and trust now. I'm actually looking for a new church, to be honest with you. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute. I know the value of church hmm. because I've experienced it and it was so important in my walk, in my faith in God, walk with God. Mm -hmm. Church was instrumental in this experience, being around other people that were all here for the same thing, seeing others react to sermons and music and i love music music is what mm -hmm. got me here music and acid <laughs> <laughs> um but so i i say that it's both it's a healthy dose of both but beyond church because i do i've had issues with church and in the past church has driven me away it's community hmm I, I was going to say that when you were describing it i was going to say more like the sense of the community and having People around. That's you know, more like, important. There's church like stories or people in the church that are corrupt, and um, well, I guess like every you know everywhere there's humans. But and hey, man, that's why at the end of the day, our safety net is the Bible. The Bible tells us that we are flawed people. The Bible tells us don't rely on your own human understanding, and that means that the people running this place. And are flawed people as well. Mm. Let's not start idolizing those that are preaching the gospel. That is a sin. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So if anything, that's why I, I, so I'm, I'm a, I'm a relationship with Christ is <laughs> like, that's, that's my thing. I'm a relationship with God ism mm -hmm. religion. That's me. Christ. Like, Every day I praise, I praise the Lord. I try and bring my, pra whatever. Mm. Like even before I found my church, I was trying to do that 
with my Bible study teacher and my own Bible group. And then with my mom, who's a part, she's seventh day Adventist. I am not myself seventh day Adventist, but being around her and her people, it's inspiring their level of faith. Like my mom stayed with me for a week, uh, last week. Mm -hmm. And my mom every morning and every night prays on her knees for wow. 30 minutes. Wow. That is medit. You guys, that is meditation. Are we here? Are we hearing this clearly? Like mm -hmm. seeing that kind of discipline, that kind of willpower, no. that for me, seeing her do that was like a Christian watching a body lifter. See, that's what I admire about people who's religious, but I admire it from people who's religious or people who's very um, structured with their fitness routine or people that like these strong willpower and... That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I, I look at that and I see that and my and also like just intimately people around me in my everyday life, like try and observe and reflect on that. Prayer, Bible, church is my or God prayer Bible church is my mm -hmm. order of things mm -hmm. through enough. and through. That's fair enough. Like that, that's, that's what got me here. I would have never, if you would have asked me four years ago <laughs> that I would be hosting a Bible show. You'd be like, now nah, you, you got the wrong person. I mean, <laughs> I was literally arguing against God. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, Man, I can't tell you. I'm. I've been saved, and I'm so. I am so. I feel like it's a moral obligation to talk about how Christ has saved my life. Like I, I would not. I don't know if I would be here today. That sounds so dramatic, and I know it sounds dramatic. I'm wearing pink gloves. I sound bubbly or whatever, but like, no, I'm an emo girl. Like I was a depressed, dark little baby, baby, babe. And like, I'm telling you right now, Christ saved my life. Yeah, and it, it, it is my happened. moral obligation to talk about that. Talk about my testimony. That's all I can do. Mm -hmm. Whether you come to it or not, or, a or you know, that's beyond me. Mm -hmm. I can only t tell my honest truth. And that is that, you know, Yahweh is the way. And now... Let's get into the book of Ruth. So as we know, and if we've been following Bible stories, Ruth follows judges. Now, some theologians say that the story of Ruth was supposed to go somewhere after Proverbs, but as the way it is in most Holy Bibles, It's the story that comes right after Judges. And in Judges, we know we left off. The land of Israel is in chaos. I mean, the people have fallen in vile and disturbing ways. So disturbing that I just didn't do them on this podcast. <laughs> If you guys noticed, I did not do the last three chapters of Judges. If you guys are curious about it, go watch Horrible Decisions episode 191, where I go on Wheezy's show the, for the very first time and only time. I tell one of the stories of one of those chapters. It's on some Sodom and Gomorrah level <laughs> sin. Okay. <laughs> so I was just like, let's just skip right after that. You know? Um, so we know that the people have fallen and the first line of Ruth is actually, this is in the time of judges. So we know that Ruth is in the time of judges and a couple side information for you guys. The book of Ruth is so short. Seriously, you guys, it takes like, a, I'm telling you, 12 minutes tops to read the book. It's four chapters. Please pause the show and read it and then come back. Like, it's, it's really that short, okay? Um, another imp uh, thing to note that my mom told me, actually, she said, ah, el libro de Ruth. Did you know, Brianda, that is the only book that does not mention God? What accent is that? 
my mama accent. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> She's um, Dominican. Um, pero they don't mention, pero like, they don't mention God in the story of Ruth. Hmm. They do, there are like slight mentions of it, algo ligero, pero nothing like the other books. It shows, it's so short, they don't have time. <laughs> no, not even that, girl, because there are other books. There are other short books that mention God. It's just, this book is about life, the mundane, mm. the, everyday the everyday walks to the laundromat. It's like waking up, every, not extravagant. We just finished talking about Moses. We just finished talking about, you know, uh, uh, Joshua mm. and uh, um, Samson, the last episode, like all these characters that are kapow like the Lil Nas X of the, <laughs> of the Bible, you know? And all of a sudden we get to Ruth and the stories are so utterly normal mm. and regular. Mm. Alas, the importance of Ruth. It shows them like how God works in everyday language and everyday form. And so don't sleep on Ruth. It's one of those books that some people could brush over, but there's a lot of theological gems to grab from Ruth if you really dig deep. And today we're about to start digging. Mm. So, the story of Ruth, like I said, it says it happens in the time of Judges, right? And we're introduced to uh, four characters off jump. We're introduced to an uh, uh, Israelite family from Bethlehem. And uh, the, the, the father, the main guy, well, not the main guy of the story, but uh, in chapter one, we're introduced to Elimelech, his wife, Naomi, and their two kids. Um, the son's name was Maron and what's his name? Chevrolet. What's that second one's name? I got this right now. I said Chevrolet. No, 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 no. For real though. His name was Chilion. Uh, and this family, this Israelite family right now in Bethlehem, they're experiencing a terrible famine. Mm. Like there's no food in the land. And you know that in previous stories, like the, these things happen in seasons, right? But when they happen, they, they annihilate people. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the family has to leave to a land of Moab. Do you remember Moab? Mm -hmm. Moab is where the enemy is. Moab is where all the pagans are. Okay. It's all where the money's at, right? And also money, a lot okay. of money, a lot of sin, mm. uh, a lot of idol worshiping, a lot of sexual immorality, a lot of like, <laughs> 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 if you guys saw Clara's face, please go to the YouTube. Um, yes, so, they, but, they, but they have no other choice, right? Like there's a famine, mm. they have to go there. And they know that the land of Moab is, and now maybe I'll attach a photo of the geography. They're uh, uh, east of the Jordan. Uh, if I'll, I'll put the, the, or are they west? I'll put the photo. Maybe I got to look at it too. <laughs> somewhere um, there. Actually, no, I'm going to look at it. I actually have it. I think I have it somewhere in my studies. Okay. No, no, no. They're east of the Dead Sea. Um, and I'll attach just for geography purposes so you guys get the setting, you know? So we have this family, uh, Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two kids are off to Moab, the land of Moab, the enemy territory for any Israelites, right? Hmm. Um, uh, for hopes of a better future. Let's hop into scripture so that we have a little bit more context. Ruth chapter one, verse two. The name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife was Naomi and the names of his two sons were Mahlon, Mahlon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. Now, immediately after, because you know this is a short book, so they get right to it. We find out tragedy strikes and Elimelech dies tragically. Mm. So sad, right? And then within the time frame of 10 years, Naomi's two sons die. Oh my it's God. It's very quick. It's a short book. Everybody's dying. It's, <laughs> it's tragic. Could you imagine being 
Naomi. But here's the thing. Before her two sons died, they did marry two women, two Moabite women, by the Mm. way, which is actually against their Hebrew, the covenant law. You're not supposed to marry Moabites, but they married two Moabite women. Uh, Mm -mm. So the two children married Orpah and Ruth. Every time I say Orpa, my I don't have dyslexia, but I feel like I do. I'm always like Oprah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Orpa Orpah and Ruth were these two Moabites that were married to Naomi's sons. Okay. Are we clear here? Mm-hmm. Cool. So now Naomi and her daughters-in-laws are all widows. A house filled of widows. How tragic and sad. It is. Right? Now Naomi is old and she feels gutted. She feels hopeless. She feels like she has nothing else. And in that time for widows, widows and children like orphans were the most vulnerable group. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Their male counterparts, their male partners were their breadwinners. They were their protectors. You know, people would violate widows at that time. Yeah. And as a woman, you can't really do much in that society, really. Exactly. Can't really work and really like. Yeah. And now here's this woman who now has thinking about these two girls. Like, oh my gosh, like I have nothing to offer. Like, how am I going to protect you guys? Mm. How about we, how about we just separate? You know, at, at this point she says, I have nothing to offer you. You guys, please go, go somewhere else. Like. What, to her children? To, to the two girls. Like, I can, there's nothing I can do for you. You guys would fend better for yourselves that are, they're young. Mm. You know, they're, they're two young women. They could probably have another life. They're from Moab, right? They, go, so go, go back to your mother. Go back to your land. That's sad. Though. You know? Um, so let's go into scripture to see exactly what she says. Mm. Naomi tells them in Ruth chapter one, verses eight to nine, go, Return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt in the dead with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. But Naomi said, turn back my daughters. Why will you go with me? You know, she's. That's so sad. But that's that's a love of a mother, though. That's a mother, yeah. And not only a mother, but like, it's almost like, I, I, while we're telling the story of Ruth, I want us to put ourselves in the position of every character we talk about, hmm. right? Because that's what, if we're looking at this through the laws of hermeneutics, we're reading the Bible in a new way, Bible hmm. listeners. Like, this is an opportunity to, huh, kind of look at it like an actor does a script, like the shoes of someone who is in pain. Hmm. That kind of, that level of tragedy and hopelessness. And love, because you may be in pain, but you're ultimately looking for the best interest of your daughters, even though that obviously breaks your heart as a mother to, yeah. you know, se- be separated. For sure. Dude, at this point, Naomi even changes her name to Mara. Hmm. It doesn't last, but like during this window of time, um, and I'll tell you why it doesn't last <laughs> later, because Ruth is actually a beautiful book. It's a, mm. it's a, celebratory joyous book um but mara means bitter oh wow yeah well anywho so when she tells orpa and naomi like y'all gotta get out of here like go save yourselves orpa's like i bet y'all be easy <laughs> but can you blame her though listen i don't even think of orpa as an as an enemy in my head i'm like you know what? It is the best solution. It is of, the yeah. best option at that point. Mm-hmm. And maybe God's not working through her for Naomi. Mm. Because you know who stays? The Ruth. Oh. Ruth. Ruth stays. And that's why she got a book dedicated to her. <laughs> and that's why that girl got the best PR in here. She said, I'm going to get four chapters, but they going to slap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anywho, so... Naomi says, okay, she goes, Ruth, sorry, I just like short circuited for a second. (laughs) LOL. (laughs) Ruth chapter 11 verses 11 through 17 will give us more context of this dialogue. So she says, and uh, Naomi says to Ruth, see, 
your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God should be my God. Wow. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts us. That's a ride or die. That's loyalty, Clara. That's loyalty. And you hear what she said? May your God be my God. Mm -hmm. She's referring to Yahweh. Ruth was a Moabite woman. Where do we remember that from? Like Rahab? Mm -hmm. She wasn't even Hebrew, but she's saying, no, 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 no. I not only want to, I'm not leaving you. I made a vow. And not only that, I've seen what your God can do. I want your God to be my God too. I'm not leaving you. Mm -hmm. Imagine that loyalty. And by the way, like I said, I don't fault Orpah for what she did. Any norm, any, any like sane person would have left, right? Look for your own best interest. Yeah. You can't blame her. I can't blame her. She represents so many people in life. Mm. But Naomi stayed. Like, imagine that level of character. And I know those women. My mom is that way. Mm-hmm. My, I see my mom in every single thing my mom does. I've never met someone who is as honest and disciplined and caring as my mom. I'm not there yet. I'm Orpah. I mean, like, deuces. You know what I mean? All right. See ya. See ya. Bye. You know what? <laughs> Since you said it's okay, I'm going to just go ahead and skip. Right? But... You know, there's some people who are so principled and I one day want to be a Ruth. I one day want to be like my mom, you know? Mm. Um, So that's basically how chapter one ends. And now we're diving into chapter two. It's a very quick- That's it, okay. Yeah, it's a very quick book. Now, these two women, like I said, are very vulnerable, Mm -hmm. right? And at this point, the girls have to plan, right? They're planning on leaving Moab and going back to Israel, Mm -hmm. back to Bethlehem, because Bethlehem now, they're out of the famine. They're fine now. They can go back. And Naomi knows that she has family there Mm -hmm. because Naomi's from Bethlehem. And so they plan a a way for them to get in the eyesight of some of her family. You know what I'm saying? Because these girls ain't dumb. (laughs) They know that they're both widows and they know that they're both vulnerable. And the only way that they will be saved is by a redeemer, by someone que le puede ayudar. Mm-hmm. Like someone to, to, that's the only way back then. They don't have any like uncles or. Oh, honey, <laughs> we about to get into it. Okay. Bye. So scripture, Ruth chapter two, verses one to three. And Ruth, the Moabite says to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him. Him being Boaz, pin in that, in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, Hmm. who was of the clan of Elimelech, guys, family. Wow. Of the family of Elimelech. That's the king, right? The the Oh no, you're talking about Abimelech. No. Oh. Elimelech is the uh, Naomi's dead husband. Oh. Yes, God. family. They're family. Okay. Yes, he's within the family. So Naomi spots Boaz and she's trying to, you know, she like probably like fixes her hair and stuff because she's been gleaning. She's been gleaning the grains, you know, picking up food, trying to get his attention, you know what I'm saying? And Boaz notices her major, right? Um, let's go to scripture so you guys can see like how that dialogue goes when they spot each other. Mm. Cause she's, she's out there working and the, like, trying to get, trying to get his attention. Cause she knew he was in the vicinity. You know what I'm saying? But she didn't know she was going to spot him. So scripture of Ruth chapter two, verses eight to nine. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. You guys may be a little confused right now. Basically, what Boaz is saying is he sees a woman working as hard as Ruth was, you know, because Ruth, 
Ruth has to get food and sustenance for now both of them, right? Mm-hmm. He goes, hey, you don't got to work that hard. And by the way, don't go to other don't go to other fields. That's dangerous. They will see a woman. Well, I'm assuming that Ruth was a baddie too. I'm assuming Ruth was a city girl, like beautiful. <laughs> Not a city girl like a hoe. But like, actually, well, stay tuned, okay, guys? Because we got some conspiracy theories, <laughs> biblical conspiracies. <laughs> but um, he he goes, don't go anywhere else. It's dangerous. Just I got you. Boaz at this point is like over generous, over like he, per the laws of Deuteronomy and stuff, we are to be generous to those that have less than us. Boaz is basically doing what a Hebrew who follows the word of God would do in any time of need. Right. Okay. So he basically tells her, listen, I got you. Right. Like we said in chapter two, verses eight to nine, let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? He said, he told the men in the area not to touch her. Mm-hmm. Okay? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Drink whatever you want. He's telling her, I got okay. you. You know, and Ruth is so grateful. She gets on her knees and she's like, <gasps> she does not, that's enough. Stop <laughs> it. She gets on her knees to worship. Oh. Stop it. Y'all not going to play my girl Ruth like that. Stop okay. it. No. I was like, she's what? No. Stop <laughs> it. You're not going to do that here. No. Okay. I am a child of God. No way. But she's basically like, oh my God, like, thank you so much on her knees and worshiping. Like, oh my God, this is so great. He gives her so, and she tells her like, by the way, like I'm, I'm a widow. I'm taking care of my like widowed mother-in-law mm. and Boaz is so impressed by how noble and principled she is and strong and strong. It makes her, it makes him want to take care of her even more, mm-hmm. you know? And so she runs off with all this grain that Boaz has supplied her with. And she goes to Naomi and she's like, yo, cunha, like, listen, <laughs> I just got so much grain from this dude named Boaz. Like you won't believe it. And she goes, wait, but what girl, that's my homie. Like he's a family. I know him. And then Naomi's basically like celebrating with him. Oh my gosh, you have to continue seeing him. You have to see good favor in him. You know what I mean? So uh, chapter two, verse 20. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours one of our redeemers. Mm. I know, <laughs> right? This, I, oh God, I love this story. This story is so cool and even its structure because we go, we start at the top, tragedy, terrible, whatever. And like, not whatever, like that's pain. That's mm. some serious pain. And then the chapters end on a high. That's cool. That's what I, that, you know, like that's, that's that. When you read that, it makes you feel a kind of way. You know what I'm saying? It makes you feel good. Mm, it makes good. you feel hopeful. Te deja un sabor de boca, no? Yeah, exactly. So now we're at chapter three. And I like to call this like a baddie makeover. Mm. Because at this point, we know that Mo isn't going to be the redeemer. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and Naomi's like, you are not about to mess this up for the both of us, okay? I'm going to need you to start wearing deodorant. <laughs> I'm going to need you to stop wearing black. <laughs> like, because listen, I mean, Ruth, oh. Ruth was still mourning, right? She was still wearing her mourning clothes, her, her like grieving clothes, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> Naomi goes, nah, honey, we're going to wear, like I said, we're going to wear some Savage Fenty. We're going to wear some <laughs> like, that's it. We got to get this together, girl. Put some extensions in, wear some eyeliner because we got to get, we got to get this going. So she does that, right? And Ruth is excited. Ruth is like, but also because she knows what a principled, great God fearing man he is. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's, let's pause and talk about Boaz for a minute. This man was respectful, hardworking, the hombre de la hora. This guy owns so much land. I'm assuming he's older, right? Because in order to acquire all that, you have to have been tenured and like experience and stuff. Mm -hmm. He bosses people around like this guy has some status, Mm -hmm. right? And he's single. And he's single. If anything, he sees Ruth and is like, you could get anyone you want. Like, really, that's how, that's how, the way he like keeps like talking about himself, either he's like oddly self-deprecating or (laughs) Ruth is a very beautiful, (laughs) you know what I mean? So that's why I'm assuming that Ruth was really, really beautiful. Mm. Let's hop into scripture. Ruth chapter three, verses three to six. 
Naomi tells Ruth, wash therefore and anoint yourself and put your cloak, the savage Fenty, and go down to the threshing floor. Threshing floor for you guys that don't know is where farmers and such would separate their grain. You know what I mean? Go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he is finished eating and drinking. Wink, wink, Boaz. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Mm. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Oh. So Naomi is the puppeteer master oh here. Oh my God. Yes, yes, yes. And guess what? Naomi in the, not Naomi, sorry, Ruth. Ruth in the dark of night goes out to the threshing floor to where Boaz is, rolls up on Boaz's feet and stuff and is like, hey you, how you doing? And he's like, oh my God, girl, what are you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> like what? This is not safe. Like, what are you doing? You know what I'm saying? But, but then like, Ruth was like the pimp. You mean Naomi? She was, Naomi was like the pimp. She was pimping her. No, I mean, I don't like to think of it as pimping because these characters are so like noble and principled. That's like, would someone that has those characteristics be that way? Do you know what I mean? She was literally telling him, hey, this dude got money, can take us out of no. poverty. Okay, here's the thing. I understand how reading that, mm. you can maybe like assume these things. But like I said, in the text, right? Because I can only read what the text tells me. These people are uh, presenting such humility and they're so altruistic you can laws of hermeneutics right mm -hmm. we have to use laws of hermeneutics when uh, uh interpreting any biblical text you can infer that that's not really what these people were about mm -hmm. do you know what i mean like at that time that was that was the cultural norm fair enough when you had a widow the thing to do was to go to the redeemer of the family which is a distant relative okay. to save the family in essence mm, you saved it you say it because it did sound like. But that's what I mean. But laws of hermeneutics, guys, mm. right? But if anything, I want to encourage us to, yes, it's fun to think of it that way. But if you look deeper, if you see the words for what they are, if you really study the text, not to say that this show, this podcast is a Bible study, because I don't believe it is, but some people take it that way and whatever. But that's not really what it is. The, 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 the characteristics from these people do not point in that direction. Hmm. But they may point to an erection because <laughs> Ruth ends up spending the night. <laughs> but no, 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 I'm joking. But like Ruth ends up spending the night like at, at Boaz's feet. But they have like this dialogue where she says like, you're our redeemer and, and whatever. And honestly, Boaz at this moment was so like flattered and stuff. Like he was like, honestly, I would. Boaz, this is how humble Boaz is. Or ugly. You know what? Wow. <laughs> I mean, Hi, Tangi. <laughs> I thought the same thing. I literally said, oh, this is an ugly king. Yeah. Oh, yes. This is an ugly legend. Yeah. Because that's, a, that's a, listen, I love an ugly boy. <laughs> I tweeted the other day. It looks like it's about to be an ugly boy summer. But I love <laughs> ugly boys. Ugly boys can get it. Like an ugly guy who is like, uh, well-mannered, principled, generous, takes care of a woman. Obviously you're ugly. So I know you had to develop a personality. <laughs> like, I know you're funny. I know you had to like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I know you don't, you, I know that your conquests aren't just on your looks. I know you have to work. That for me is kind of cool. Like mm -hmm. give me an ugly prince. Give me everything. Give me all of that. Plus the cute. I mean, yes. Yes, that would be ideal in over six feet. Yes. And over in over six figures. <laughs> that would be great. But like in my eyes, I'm like, yo, this guy is so humble. He says to Ruth, wait, actually, there's a relative that's closer to me than you guys. Mm. He's actually by law supposed to be your guardian, your redeemer. But he don't have the money. No, hold, yeah. hold on. Don't skip the star read, Sorry, 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 sorry. So Boaz tells Ruth, listen, I'm flattered. And like, I think that you're a beautiful woman and I, I see your heart and you're a noble woman, by the way. Boaz describes Ruth as 
a noble woman of character. Mm. Um, in the book of Proverbs, they describe what like an exemplary Christian woman should be and a, cr- a true dynamite 10 out of 10 Christian woman should be someone who is of noble character. That's why some theologians say that the book of Ruth is actually placed after Proverbs. Mm. Uh, I believe it's Proverbs 31. A Proverbs 31 woman mm. is what some Christians call it. So you can see that she actually fits yeah. this scripture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's so funny that he, but that's how, that's the eyes that Boaz sees Ruth as. Mm. So he he doesn't even, he goes, I'm not even going front, girl. There's someone else. Now, listen, if he don't take you, if that relative doesn't take you, I promise you, I'm not going to let you guys down. I'm not going to let you. And she knows that they're a package deal. It's mm-hmm. not just Ruth. And she comes with a book bag. Well, the, well, exactly. Yeah. Baggage. Oh, Baggage. Oh, yeah, it's got. Naomi. Honestly, I feel the same way. Listen, whoever marries me got to take my mom too. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> I love my mama. She going to take the condo. She going to take the like the guest room. <laughs> G- gladly listen my mom our kids would be blessed to have my mother raising them so like mm-hmm. listen i love how i'm talking to like not my husband <laughs> but if my husband is out there just so you know please dm me anyways <laughs> um so he says there's actually someone else that goes ahead of me if he doesn't take you guys i, I promise you i'm gonna th- you're mine like mm-hmm. i got you so it's so crazy that you called him ugly because i literally you like made a note too? i mean any girl that reads it's like Okay, anybody that's that humble gotta be ugly. LOL. Anyways, so chapter four, we're already at the last chapter. Wow. Okay. So now Boaz does a ceremony because it's the legalities of having a redeemer take over. There are certain things, you know, so he gets like 10 people involved, like 10 witnesses almost, you know, it's like a courthouse wedding almost, right? And he brings a guy and then Boaz talks to the guy. He's like the facilitator. He's like, listen, let's just go, you know, Naomi, like, you know, she's our family. And then we got Ruth, like, bada, bada, boom, boom, boom. When it's just Naomi, the guy's like, the the guardian is what they're Mm -hmm. known as in the, in the text. Um, the guardian goes, yeah, I'll, of course I'm the redeemer. Yeah, I'll take her. Mm. And then Boaz go, okay. Also, you also got to take Ruth, who's a Moabite. And sounds like she's not as pretty as Naomi. No, no, you're confusing the names. Naomi is the mother. Oh, okay. Naomi's the mother-in-law. Okay, okay, okay. He's okay with taking Naomi. Okay. Because Naomi's a Hebrew. Naomi is family. Yeah, and then when he sees, but Ruth, when Boaz says that you also have to take Ruth, the guardian says, listen. I, and, and again, these are much like Orpa. Remember Orpa at the beginning? Mm-hmm. It's kind of like, the, we understand though. He's saying, he, he doesn't really know Ruth. He doesn't know Ruth's heart. Like Fair Boaz enough. knows Ruth's heart. Mm. He's just looking at her on paper and he sees, oh, she's a Moabite. Oh. I can't bring her into my family. I can't mess up my inheritance like that. I'm sorry. Mm. So he actually says, I'm not. And there's this ceremony where like, you have to take off your sandal. It's like a whole thing, which is so funny. It reminds you. It reminds me of when um, uh, God tells people to take their shoes off and stuff. But it's like it's like this whole thing. So the guardian actually denies it. He rejects it. Wow. Yeah, he says no. I can't because I can't take a foreigner like that. I'm just not doing it. And Boaz, what is he scared that he will not be like? Um as truth to God and then he'll yeah, be punished. Exactly. That's why I don't even blame these people who mm. aren't really uh, pushing the story along, but doing their own thing. Because I mean, can you blame them at this time? They have a covenant with God. The mm. covenant says you can marry someone who's not of the, you know what I mean? It allows you to um, uh, zoom out mm. and see all these different characters in life, in your life. Mm-hmm and see what they do as well. And it almost humanizes them. It makes you understand their positions. Yeah. It doesn't make you condemn them. I don't know, it's fair enough. I mean, you have your plate at, st- at stake, so yeah. you can- Yeah, he bring- has people to do, you have people to take care of and stuff, you know? So that that's what I mean. And again, in the story of Ruth, I, I wanna reiterate that God isn't really mentioned that much in the text, but you see the way God moves through the decisions that these characters make. And I know we're not at moral of the story yet, but there's a little glimmer of that. All mm. these decisions and choices that the people are making are all a part of the plan, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Even if they're not these like sensational acts of uh, nobility and like humility, right? But it makes you see 
everyone in a more humanizing way. Yeah, and it's like you said, it's the everyday like Mon the mundane, yeah. the everyday life, right? So he says no, and then Boaz, of course, he says, "I'm not going to let you guys down. I got you." So Boaz ends up marrying Ruth. Oh, oh how sweet! <laughs> they end up marrying Ruth, and the end of chapter four is like they're overjoyed. Ruth and Boaz end up having a baby named Bo um, Obed. Oh. It's so cute, guys. And oh my gosh. And Naomi is so thrilled. Naomi is so happy. She loves that baby like it's her own. Mm. And guess what, guys? The end of Ruth is very important. People typically glaze their eyes over any, anytime there's genealogy, like a list of genealogy, they like read past it, whatever. No, don't do that. Because the end of Ruth shows that this little book is actually a pretty big book. Ruth and Boaz's child, Obed, is the great-grandfather of King David. King David, guys, one of the most important, renowned kings, one of the first kings. Mm -hmm. Which leads us into the next book, First Samuel. First Sam Samuel is a prophet who is the person who presents the first kings of Israel, mm -hmm. Saul and David. Mm. Major. And we all know, anyone who's anyone knows that King David is a direct descendant of Jesus. <laughs> You guys, this is, is this all cool? Like, are you kidding me? Like, this is a major. Um, oh, oh what, what was another thing that I just, um, I just read? I just read that. It's so funny. You know, everyone knows David from like the story of David and Goliath. You know, that's one of, you don't know the story I'm, of David and Goliath? No. <gasps> I'm, I'm sure everyone knows. Everyone that. knows that you guys, who is running my show? So someone left a comment that's like, LOL, it's so funny that Wheezy acts like she doesn't know these stories. And I'm like, uh, we're not acting. Like we generally don't she know. She's not playing. No. <laughs> she don't know these stories. Like, but these are very, very famous biblical stories. Um, it turns out, I did some research mm. that Orpah, you know, Orpah, the, the sister-in-law that left mm -hmm. is a direct descendant of Goliath. Which Goliath is the, 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 there's a huge story that happened. Well, we'll, we'll get to it in the next couple of weeks, by the way, but David and Goliath are, they, they fight against one another. There's a battle that happens, which very, the, the, I don't even want to touch on it because it's, I want to like give it its own episode. <laughs> but for those of you who know, um, can you guys believe that? Cause I didn't know that. And you guys, another little piece of information that I got in my research that I thought was so fun. You guys, guess who Boaz's mother is? <gasps> Rahab! No! Yes! Son of a... Yes! No. Yes! <laughs> Rahab, the pagan prostitute yeah. from the story of Joshua, is Boaz's mother. What? Yes, yes. So wait, technically... He's not 100% uh, Israeli, right? Well, he is right? because he was born in the land. And remember oh, that Rahab, okay. Rahab was adopted in and whatever. Yeah, but, yeah. but you make a good point. But like His mother was an outsider. Is, yeah. He married an outsider. How <sighs> beautiful. What a story. What a story. If you really dive in. I like, like the story of Ruth. I know. Me too. It's about people. It's about connection. Mm -hmm. It's about real. It's about family. It's about what we know. It's about... Uh, how people move, how, how people move in our lives and how God uses the people in our lives. Mm, uh, oh, it gets me going. And like, all of them are related to Jesus. And like, I'm like, ah, my King, <laughs> my King, my one and only King. <laughs> Anyways, guys, now let's get to moral of the story. Moral of the story is God uses us. We are all musicians in this special orchestra. And he is the composer of the entire piece. He's the conductor. He's the music. Today we learned that who we are in life and the choices that we make dictate how that symphony is going to sound. 
who are you in this story? Are you Naomi at the beginning, you know, in pain and tragedy? Ruth, you know, a bold outsider, but relentlessly loyal? Are you Boaz, a normal, everyday, hardworking guy? Or are you the guardian that rejected Ruth for being a Moabite? The choices we make says a lot about where we're going in life and in love, but even in the everyday things, at work, at school, at Starbucks, we are a part of a bigger story. And every decision we make, every conversation we have, who we choose to ignore or embrace, it all plays a role in why we are here. Why are we all here? And what's it all about? What's our purpose, you know? Anyways, today's story is a tale of redemption and connection. And that last verse in Ruth reminds us that we are connected to the ultimate redeemer, all of us. And who we are is a part of a bigger plan. So who are you going to be today? Or how is God using you? Ooh! Hey, Father. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, no bra this week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I am a pop star. Father. Yeah, see you next week. No, I'm, I'm telling, I think I'm a, I don't know, like a pod star. <laughs>